So allow me to put on my lecture hat for looking into the future. I'm going to give you a little background about my company and myself, actually more than you probably want to know. And I'm going to try to end before 10.30. I'm going to pack a one-hour lecture into 30 minutes. There we go. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, we've been busy for 30 years with projects for most major corporations and startups around the world. I've written or co-published 14 books and about 350 articles, and we have been working on 10 machine projects, which I'll report on in this afternoon. <coughs> I'm a master of the Ditao Academy <coughs> in Shanghai, uh, where I'm starting a center for UX innovation, user experience. That's the abbreviation I'll use. Here are some of our clients. You probably know their logos. Here are some of the books and publications and magazines. I've been a uh, editor-in-chief in the past for User Experience magazine. And these are some of the books I've written or co-written, published, edited, or co-edited over the past years. We now have done actually 10 machine projects. The ninth was the Happiness Machine, which I just reported on in Greece. I'll talk about them this afternoon. And in Shanghai, the Ditao Academy is trying to bring um, experts from around the world to China to import the wisdom of the West, the best of the West, into Shang Shanghai. This lecture began several years ago when I was invited to <coughs> give a keynote for a scientific technical conference. I now have a free downloadable ebook, which you can find at our website about this entire topic that I'm going to talk about, and I've been giving versions of it around the world. I edited a special issue of User Experience Magazine on the future, with this lovely lady showing a, something called a blink of fire to magnify her blinking. Ooh, this is not showing up too well, but, well. I've <coughs> recently edited some publications on this topic. I'm going to survey 100 years of science fiction movies in less than 30 minutes. It all started perhaps in 1260 when Roger Bacon talked about flying machines that can beat through the air, like giant birds. This is several hundred years before Leonardo. When I grew up as a child, I read science fiction magazines like this, which were very optimistic about the future, except for occasional wars of robots and destructions by aliens. In fact, I was so influenced by science fiction, I designed my own uh, space helmet <laughs> that my younger brother, late younger brother Stephen, is wearing, modeling here uh, in Omaha, Nebraska, where I grew up. And I built my first rocket ship control panel. That's the only surviving photo with, I guess, part of my finger in the way. <coughs> and I drew images like this of rocket ships and devices like this. I didn't know it, but at the age of 10, I was already a user interface designer. I just didn't know the term. Many decades later, wearing this very same hat, I led a panel at uh, a major conference called the uh, Akai Computer Human Interaction. I was invited back. I brought uh, leading science fiction writers to envision the future. So user interface design, for those of you who are aware of interaction design, includes interaction, but also creation of mental models, metaphors, all the appearance characteristics of color and typography, as well as thinking about the content, the user community, and the software and hardware to support these devices. <coughs> At the same time, there's a taxonomy of the uh, science fiction literature, or movies, or TV. Uh, and if you cross those, you get a really complex list of topics which would keep PhDs busy for decades, and I hope they will, because this is new, a new area for investigation at looking how Science fiction has envisioned the future. Um, <clears throat> there are assumptions about who are the users, cultural diversity, user-centered design, whether speech and audio are emphasized, etc. Whether the future seems masculine or feminine dominant, whether people or machines dominate, etc. I'm going to look at all of this very quickly just to give you an idea. <clears throat> We're going to start with some of the earliest science fiction, which was uh, done in France 
uh, especially by the Melier brothers. You may know a trip to the moon in which a rocket ship flies to the moon and lands in someone's face. It used a lot of interesting uh, innovative animation and is sort of the first sci-fi film, although others claim to, to have done that. <coughs> and you may know 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Um, one of the ones that's best known is Fritz Lang's Metropolis. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's a very fine classic film in general. And it's a science fiction film. And it features robots for the first time, female robots, uh, television-like displays. This is 1927, about 40 years before commercial TV. There's a busy executive with a rather clean desk <coughs> and a large tabulator by which he can communicate with all kinds of people. Interestingly, the controls in the background are very much like the late 19th century, early 20th century controls. Some of you may know Flash Gordon. <coughs> he also had flat screen uh, television-like displays in a 1936 version of the film that were not too different from those that were shown in 2001 or that adorn our walls today, uh, <coughs> some 80 years later. Speaking of drones, uh, Superman saved Lois Lane in this 1941 movie with uh, uh, flying robots, and this film was interesting because it was later used in Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow, if you happen to remember that film from about five to ten years ago. That film was the first science, the first uh, commercial movie done on a Macintosh, uh, using a lot of uh, uh, special effects that were created on a small desktop PC. And some of this imagery appears in that later movie because the, the creator of the movie was very much influenced by this specific uh, animation. Probably no one of you remembers Captain Video from the 1950s. I used to watch him along with Tom Corbett's Space Cadets. Uh, these were done in real live TV, no uh, tape backups in case something went wrong and once the entire control panel fell over right during the performance and the co-captain picked it up and said to the captain, good thing no wires were broken, captain, and went on with the script because they couldn't do anything else. Those films uh, in the 1960s uh, often featured twirling magnetic tape reels and giant displays in the background, often with many blinking lights because that was a symbol of incredible technology <coughs> and the future. And of course, white lab coats. What would we do without white lab coats? Um, the era of IBM mainframes. This kind of image was used in, in 2011 for the conference I lectured at, just as a reminder of our heritage from the past and these holes you might know as the holes punched in uh, computer hole earth cards. Uh, here's another 1960s science fiction movie as usual, the men in machines, heavily suited, white lab coats, big displays in the background. They go to another planet, which is all women. Amazingly, they don't need all that technology and they don't seem to need much clothing either. Uh, and they're communicating telepathically with each other. That's a kind of theme that we'll see in a number of these uh, movies. Let's look at some more recent cinema with the same topics that I mentioned earlier. You may know this image from Star Wars. Star Wars was a breathtaking change in <coughs> filmdom and certainly sci-fi movies. Interestingly, it didn't have too much human-computer interaction innovation. Uh, it introduced the lightsaber, a kind of medieval sword, sword fighting again, uh, and a little bit of mind control of some objects here and there. But in general, there wasn't that much innovation except for dirty rocket ships. It was the first time that rockets and control surfaces and everything were beat up and rusty and decaying. In all the past science fiction, everything was always brand spanking new. The Terminator series with Arnold Schwarzenegger introduced a lot of augmented reality as if a super smart silicon human robot would actually need these kind of displays to understand things. This is mostly for the audience of the movie looking at things to know what the robot is seeing and reacting to. 
Another series that was <coughs> tremendously uh, influential was Star Trek. Some of you may be fans. Um, this, this communicator was so well known that it was even copied in a movie called Galaxy Quest, a, a kind of spoof on Star Trek. One of the notable things about the movie was that it featured a multi-racial, multi-gender, multi-human alien crew. Uh, and it was very notable for that inclusive nature of its cast. In a recent version, 2013, <coughs> uh, the, 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 the images were incredibly interesting and complex. Medical diagnostic equipment back here that from a user interface point of view you really wanted to look at, but they didn't show any detailed close-ups, unfortunately. They spent most of the time on a few na half-naked bodies of women, usually, uh, and explosions. Uh, unfortunately, that's a formula for summer blockbusters. Uh, they did feature transparent displays. This is a lot of text backwards as we're able to see the actor looking at the displays, and that's one of the advantages of transparent displays. It's a movie creation which is very convenient because the camera can look right at the actor and see those, those depictions. Um, a video game that was introduced around that time was also oriented to warriors, to action, uh, not so much on uh, human-computer interaction innovation. You might know this scene from 2001 where Hal is reading the uh, uh, actor's lips. Uh, Stanley Kubrick introduced a, a lot of scientific realism that was uh, very innovative for its time, including the fact that space was silent. You didn't hear rocket engines because there's no air to carry the sound. Uh, he did have a few off guesses about the future, like people are still using the equivalent of phone booths to call home. Uh, they have an executive meeting room here with no PCs and no paper, not really much technology at all. A lot of the displays <coughs> of data were rather mm, conventional. Uh, there were no mobile phones in this version of 2001, which he got off. Um, there is also one of the first examples of of human computer interaction humor. This is a man reading the instruction uh, guide for using the toilet in space. And by the time he's finished reading all of those instructions, it's probably too late. <coughs> uh, they did have some kind of desktop or flat displays on a table. They had some realism in terms of time delay of communicating back to Earth. A lot of the uh, Spaceship controls were somewhat advanced, multi-screen displays, etc. although a lot of the informational displays look like CAD CAM imagery from the 1980s. You may know this version <coughs> actually from Tron Legacy, not the original Tron movie. Uh, this was notable for trying to create the world of video games and the world of software to visualize that, which was somewhat innovative. Again, something like lightsabers, throwing discs around, but mostly riding motorcycles and having cool costumes. The, the only situation where there was a lot of user interface display was uh, actually looking more like Unix from early days of computer technology. I don't know if you know this one. It comes from a movie called Brazil, which is one of my favorites. It had, it's by Terry Gilliam uh, as director, so it has lots of crazy, uh, uh, insane, uh, technology like this little exoskeleton helping this woman type on her keyboard as she types the screams of someone being tortured in the next room. Um, it, it overdone technology, all gone crazy with too many wires, too many pipes, and that's part of the humor of this and, and, and sort of depressing, cynical view of the future. <coughs> Who can forget Arnold Schwarzenegger extracting a sensor from his left nostril in uh, Total Recall. The Recall had a lot of innovation in technology. Head displays that came apart, full-scale x-rays, simulated environments at home, not just rocket ship control panels, but things that consumers would have in the everyday environments. Of course, it had its heavy-duty electronic and metal displays for transforming his memories. 
Also, a, a touching note of, of computer humor, he's checking into a hotel in uh, hundreds of years from now, and everything is quite advanced, but this display screen is a PC display screen from the 1990s, as though the hotel never got you know, advanced technology to update its computer system. Uh, Total Recall was redone in 2012, and some more technology innovation seems to be part of the series, including this, this uh, kind of handphone of, t of pieces of uh, silicon and wires embedded in the hand, which is removed surgically during the movie in a rather horrible moment. Uh, but while it's still operating, uh, it projects onto a piece of glass and you can continue talking. That may be a phone call coming from the film. Um, this image you may recall from The Matrix, uh, dripping typography. That's something interesting happening. That's outside? Oh. Oh. Um, so uh, this featured plugging into computer systems as occurred in Neuromancer and other of the cyberpunk science fiction authors from the early 1990s. Many of the scenes were dark and dreary uh, and, and heavily mechanical uh, technology contrasted with some very bright uh, fantasy scenes. Uh, this is what actually, oh, oh, this uh, previous image shows this fellow looking at all of these multiple displays from about six feet away. It's doubtful whether he could actually read anything on those displays. This is what an actual Bloomberg multi-screen display looks like, conveying incredible amounts of financial information. I'm told this is a real person uh, looking at these displays. I don't know how long they last, eight hours a day looking at this amount of information before they have a meltdown, but by then perhaps they're rich enough to retire. Um, <coughs> this, this fascination with big data, big amounts of information display carries on in a movie that I'll show you in a moment, Oblivion from 2013, wh where this can slide back and forth and up, up the wall and is simply overpowering in its informational density. People have even tried to construct some of the informational displays shown in Tron um, using actual software as a kind of tribute, a tribute dashboard to things that were created to be faked in cinema. This is a scene you, if you ever saw it, uh, it's probably one of the most memorable science fiction creations uh, that you will have ever seen. This is biomorphic uh, material like flesh uh, that's uh, used for interacting with computer systems in a video game uh, oriented movie. As with uh, Matrix, there's a direct uh, connection to the spinal column. This, I think, is uh, material that's stuffed into the spinal column at some point. This is bloody technology. They're actually growing flesh in a, in a laboratory that's kind of messy and wet. Um, a little brain cap to help people uh, communicate. So let's catch up in the 15 minutes that are remaining uh, with some of the later movies. This is a memorable scene with Tom Cruise doing hand gestures. Um, anyone actually having to do that for a period of time would get awfully tired gesticulating in space like that, but it was great for the movie. He was mostly flipping photos around or videos around. There are some transparent uh, uh, virtual uh, creatures or, or uh, scenes. Um, and a lot of uh, advanced uh, technology, including transparent displays that we've seen before. Now, these transparent displays actually do exist. Uh, uh, they're available from Samsung and other manufacturers. If you don't want to look through the window out there, you can put down artificial blinds to block out the sun or anyone's view of you, but you can also see the weather or your computer screen or anything else that you would like to see on that display. <coughs> Speaking of uh, human computer interaction, if two hands aren't enough, you can have one or two more grafted onto the ends of your feet, as this person has an Eon Flux. Uh, it was innovative in that regard, as well as um, skin diagrams or maps that pop up on the surface of the skin to 
to help guide people through space. And it features something like little rolling drones uh, that the heroine has, casts out onto the floor and they roll around to gather data like uh, sensitive marbles. Interestingly, to gather them up, she whistles for them <laughs> and they come back to her. Uh, she also has an artificial eye to help her see things that human beings can't normally see. Here's an informational display which is featured in uh, a movie. This is ultraviolet, uh, supposedly taking place only about 60 years from now. Uh, by then, language has changed so much that we can't even read the displays. Uh, this is some leftover remnant of society that has survived a plague, I believe. And it's unusual to have informational displays like this given such prominence in a movie. Uh, human computer interaction, user experience is usually a kind of a light touch in the movies because they're mostly about action, falling in love, danger, uh, parts of the story arc that are <coughs> extraneous to or different from some of <coughs> my professional concerns. Did feature throwaway paper phones, which was kind of interesting. Uh, this is a very funny and very sad and terrifying uh, scene from a movie called Idiocracy, uh, a great comedy, but it depicts a future 500 years from now when everyone is so stupid that most of the people are just sitting, sitting stoned looking at pornography and ads and uh, they can't spell so typewriters just have pictograms. Uh, the news announcers on Fox News are all naked. Uh, this is the President of the United States addressing Congress with a submachine gun just for security purposes and no one can spell anymore. Uh, the hero is an ordinary person from today who is put in a, a cryogenic, I guess, chamber and accidentally lost and wakes up 500 years later as the smartest person on earth because everyone else has been so dumbed down from uh, the educational system. Luckily, he saves the earth by explaining to people and convincing them that you don't water plants with Gatorade you should use water. Uh, <coughs> another uh, scene from a well-known movie, Avatar. Again, uh, men in machines and heavy metal armor uh, battle against women on uh, this uh, distant planet to try to get unobtainium, kind of a funny name. Uh, here's uh, the transparent displays, so prominent in many movies. You can actually see the word Avatar backwards Ratava, uh, because that's what will happen. Uh, this is a great scene uh, from uh, District 9, um, a very fine science fiction movie which I would recommend to you. And there's just about a two minute sequence in which the hero, uh, uh, rather the alien creature, gets back in control of the spaceship and starts to manipulate some of the controls. You will see human, uh, not human, you will see a creature-machine interaction with touch displays that is more beautiful than you have ever seen in any other science fiction movie and much more beautiful than Tom Cruise waving his arms around uh, kind of aimlessly. This is a scene from Prometheus, uh, which you may have seen recently by Ridley Scott. It features a lot of innovative uh, displays of equipment uh, on another planet by superhuman creatures who actually created humanity on Earth. Uh, this is a um, cyborg who is a sort of a hero. Uh, there are lots of displays featuring soft, squishy buttons, unlike most anything you've seen in previous uh, sci-fi movies. Uh, a lot, uh, lots of uh, three-dimensional displays, transparent, that we've seen in other movies as well. Um, one of the interesting things is that uh, the director wanted real sets, not just fake stuff, so he actually built a lot of these out of various materials. One of the things about science fiction movies is different from, from novels, is that you actually have to show what's going on in the background because you have a movie to do. You have to create sets, and so a lot of attention and time is given to filling out the background, which the author might 
in a novel might not have described. But here you actually get to see it. Here's Oblivion, uh, again, that scene with a very large data display, <coughs> some touch, uh, interaction, uh, video, etc. Uh, other than this particular display, most of the other displays in the movie were sort of conventional, current sci-fi stuff. But it, it was interesting because the user I that user interface, that particular bank of, of uh, displays, was a, a key feature of many scenes throughout the arc uh, of the film. And that's kind of unusual to have so much attention given to those kinds of displays. More recently, we've been interested in, seemingly, exoskeletons, things that adorn the human body. Here's Pacific Rim, which featured uh, very uh, elaborate uh, uh, virtual displays. I don't know if you can see it here. Ah, there it is. In the lower left, there is, in one of these key scenes, over and over again, this meaningless list of numbers that just floats up and down along the left of the screen. And that's sort of like the twirling magnetic tape drives of, of decades ago, just to suggest, ooh, this is very complex and detailed and you won't understand it. Uh, transparent displays mean you can look right into the actor's face as he touches something spelled backwards. Um, very elaborate visuals, I must say. Uh, lots of moments of, of uh, command and control interaction uh, with um, displays. Uh, Battlestar Galactica is, uh, is a well-known, uh, uh, I think originally UK and then US series that is uh, praised for its uh, drama and also uh, its narration. Uh, but not so much for its user interface. Recently, you may have seen Edge of Tomorrow, <coughs> another Tom Cruise vehicle uh, featuring very elaborate exoskeleton displays. And I believe, it is a sign of the times, I believe the Brazil um, um, uh, World Cup uh, opened with um, partially paralyzed people using exoskeletons to play soccer. So I this science fiction comes out of current technology and sometimes also predicts future technology. It's not only movie makers who sometimes create not very usable technology in, in terms of user-centered design. Even um, the manufacturers of equipment have created future concepts. You probably, or does anyone know this knowledge navigator concept from 1992 from Apple? It was uh, promoted all through the HCI user experience design community. It was condemned by some people, praised by others. It was condemned because even uh, sp natural speech AI people said that this uh, avatar of Steve Jobs on the screen, which would answer any question you could possibly ask, um, was, was not deliverable, they imagined, for 20 years. And guess what? They were right, because now we have Siri. But it took 20 years, and they were advertising it in magazine pictures as though, you know, just around the corner, you're going to see crazy, wonderful things from Apple like this. So they, th they thought it was slightly unethical. But uh, Apple was not the only uh, company creating these visions of the future. AT&T was, Sun Microsystems, etc. Even the military got into <coughs> this game. They created the Augmented Cognition Project in which this uh, kind of wraparound headset with a little camera here like Google Glass would look at your irises and see what, see what you're looking at, sort of. Uh, earpieces and sensors to detect your brain activity so that a computer system could decide if you're too busy looking at stuff it would send information to your ears understand because you have uh, system overload in some of your senses and the computer system would know how to do that <coughs> amazingly the actual displays were rather pathetic 
uh, looking sort of like the worst of the 1990s. I've concentrated on Europe and the US in looking at the future of human-computer interaction. Actually, there are a lot of interesting cross-cultural themes <coughs> related to uh, interaction or d uh, communication with China, India, and other countries around the world. Um, India has exhibited uh, interest in creating its own superheroes and not having Superman and Batman and Captain Marvel. And in fact, they've been creating sci-fi films since 1952. You probably have never seen these. They're <coughs> in a variety of languages uh, because India has so many different languages and they have to be translated even to get widespread circulation within India. Um, China also has a long history of science fiction, mostly unknown to India and Europe and the US. Uh, Jules Verne's novels were imported <coughs> in the late 19th and early 20th century. One of the first Chinese sci-fi movies was Death Ray on Coral Island. And it featured a scene like this. Guess what? White lab coats, <laughs> big displays in the background, whirling uh, lights and, and maybe magnetic tapes somewhere <coughs> with uh, some large screen displays. So this is uh, 1980 and very retro back to 1950s and 60s in terms of Hollywood and some European movies. Um, and let's not forget Japan. Uh, I can't even begin to show you all the sci-fi movies that have been created over the years. This is a quick selection, <coughs> including many Godzilla uh, movies that have been produced uh, uh, certainly since post-war Japan. So <coughs> in, in th this short time, I've tried to introduce you to a way of looking at movies and science fiction as a way of looking at how uh, people imagine the future of interacting with technology, <coughs> computer graphics, displays, human-computer interaction, user experience. There are a lot more things to be discovered. There are many more uh, articles and papers appearing about this at conferences. I've helped to try to stimulate this in the articles that I've written, the book that I've produced. I'm sure that we'll see much more. We haven't yet looked at kids and sci-fi, animation, manga, a lot of television, etc., which all can be studied in the future, but this is a start. <coughs> I have a few references here. I'll be happy to send you, if you give me a card, those from whom I've received a card, I'll be uh, sending some information about uh, this presentation, and you can as I say, download the book that covers most of this material uh, from our website. Thank you very much. I finished in just about the right time. Let's see if there's a question. Any question? Aaron, this is for you. Um, for appreciation of your support in the organizing committee membership for the International Conference on Computer Graphics and Media Design. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleased to be here. Thank you.